Welcome to this month's Third Thursday webinar, brought to you by Synergy Settlement Services. The Third Thursday webinar is part of an ongoing free monthly webinar series. Each presentation is done by a Synergy subject matter expert who will tackle difficult issues that arise at settlement. During today's presentation, if you have questions, type them into the control panel where it says questions. The following brief presentation will give you an overview of what Synergy does in 30 seconds. A uh, trial lawyer's job isn't to know all the nuances, to know what it takes to keep Medicaid in place or SSI and preserve Medicare and comply with the Medicare Secondary Payer Act and resolve these complicated liens that may be present. So all of those issues are issues that the trial lawyer really doesn't have the time or the expertise to deal with they need a partner that they can rely upon that can handle all of those issues, and that's, that's exactly what Synergy is. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for Synergy's third Thursday webinar. My name is Josh Pettengill. I'm one of the founding principals of Synergy Settlement Services. I also oversee our Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance Division. For those of you that aren't familiar with our firm, Synergy, everything we do at Synergy really is to make your lives easier. And I say your, your lives easier. You as plaintiff attorneys, as trial attorneys, we want to make your life easier. If you want to make you more money, you want to protect you. If you want to make sure everyone is protected and involved on the plaintiff side. Same goes for the injury victim. We're very passionate about helping injury victims. Everything we do revolves around maximizing their recovery, protecting them, and making sure there's preservation of those assets that you work so hard to obtain for them. And that, more importantly, helping them transition from the litigation process back into the real world, so to speak. Uh, you know, today we're gonna to be focusing on the Medicare secondary payer compliance, but at Synergy we also handle complex lien resolution settlements, attorney fee deferral, structured settlements, special needs trust for those of your clients who are on Medicaid, we handle it all. So at the end of the day, when you're settling a case, you can make one phone call and you can take it from there and help get you to the finish line. But this liability Medicare set-aside issue has become a very hot topic again. It kind of died down over the last few months because nothing really happened. But now it's getting a lot of press and a lot of bad press. But my, my hope today is when the time you get off this conference, you'll have the ammunition to navigate through all the, the, the wrong stuff that exists. And there's a lot of wrong that exists as it relates to liability Medicare set-asides and misinformation. I also want to encourage everyone to take notes, but also type in your questions. Any questions you have today, I promise you we will answer them as soon as possible. And I also want to encourage everyone in this conference and the seminar to follow up with us because we also offer complimentary CLEs on various settlement topics, including complex settlement planning, lien resolution, Medicare set-aside issues, special needs trust, attorney fee deferrals, all the things that we handle in house, we offer complimentary CLEs and we do that all day, every day. We're happy to come to your office and do a webinar for you. So here's a little snapshot of our plan today. I'm going to go briefly into the Medicare basics because there's some people on here that may not uh, be, be aware of some of the basics of Medicare. We're going to talk about the recent CMS activity and there's been quite a bit in the last six months and really going to focus on these, these liability Medicare set aside myths. There's so many of them and it needs to be debunked. And protecting your law firm and keeping your clients happy. As we all know, happy clients equal future referrals. So why is Synergy MSA different? I'm going to just touch upon a couple of these things. Obviously, we're a plaintiff-only firm. That's important as it relates to Medicare set-aside because this is a Medicare set-aside is a plaintiff issue, plaintiff issue only. It does not affect the defendant, the insurance company that has no skin in the game as it relates to liability Medicare set-aside. Everyone thinks they do, but they don't. They've been convinced by certain vendors or experts that they have skin in the game as well as liability MSAs. Their job is to report the case under Section 111 report. You know, we do more liability Medicare set aside than any firm in the country. I'm very proud to say that. And that being said, we handle a lot of complex matters on a daily basis. Cases that maybe you see once in a blue moon or once in a lifetime, we're very blessed to handle those cases all day, every day. And we've been also advising key stakeholders as it relates to liability Medicare set-asides for many, many years, starting with AAJ. Several years ago, some of you may remember that CMS attempted to 
come out with formal guidelines for liability Medicare set aside. And at that time, we fought vehemently against that and battled in the trenches of AAJ and, and other national trial organizations to tell CMS, look, you can't handle this issue. This is something that you need to stay away from. You don't have the statutory authority to do it. It's too big of an issue. You've got enough problems as it is as well as conditional payments as well as workers' top Medicare set aside. And ultimately, CMS ended up packing their bags and decided not to do anything at the time. And that was five years ago. Times are changing now. And we've also worked very closely with other Medicare set aside professional stakeholder groups and really advising CMS directly on these issues and telling them, look, if you're going to make this a priority, if you're going to establish formal guidelines at some point, we need to make sure our clients are protected, our clients being the plaintiffs, so that it's fair, it's equitable, it makes sense. You can't just do this unilaterally and, and hope it works out for everybody. It's not the way it's going to work. So we've been working very closely with CMS and, and advising them, and hopefully they will take into account some of the things that we're recommending. We have been recommending for years to them. And also, we've been fortunate to teach other Medicare set-aside professionals how to handle liability Medicare set-aside. For years and years and years, uh, there were Medicare set-aside professionals that were preparing liability reports but didn't have the wherewithal or the knowledge to, to do that. And it was making life very difficult for our clients because these folks were being retained as experts and giving bad information to the insurance companies, which then was getting passed on to the plaintiffs. And what's nice about our approach is that it's a tiered approach. Okay, a Medicare set any law, any statute, okay? And there are all, multiple ways to protect Medicare without having to do a Medicare set-aside. We'll get into that today. You're going to hear me say it multiple times, but again, a Medicare set-aside is never required by any law or by any, by any statute. Just like if you have a client that's on Medicaid, the only way to preserve those benefits is to establish a special needs trust. You can't force your client into doing a special needs trust, just like you can't make your client do a Medicare set-aside. There are many alternatives to doing an MSA without shifting the burden of Medicare. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is your litmus test on all your cases going forward. Number one is your client Medicare eligible. Number two is your client have potential accident-related care recommended or medical has been claimed. And number three is actually money left over that fund future medical. Again, Medicare eligible, accident related care in the future. And number three is there actual money left over to fund future medical. If any of those missing ingredients are there, there's arguably no way to do a Medicare set aside. Now, Medicare has gone on record and seen that many times to say, look, the Medicare trust fund has to be protected. Our preferred way of doing that is an MSA. You're still not required to do it. And this is something I've got to emphasize and continue to emphasize that an MSA should be looked at as an insurance policy from all sides of the fence. Life insurance, health insurance, protection insurance, that's what insurance is, is protection for you and your clients. Now, over the past 24 months, there was a lot of talk and chatter that the sky was literally falling down on us and that Medicare was starting to crack down and starting to cut off benefits for our clients and starting to ensure that the Medicare trust fund was being protected. It started about uh, 18 months ago when CMS sent an alert out to the medical community saying, look, in the future, we're going to start denying payments on the basis that they should be paid out of a liability Medicare set aside. And since they made that announcement, nothing's happened, okay? Again, we handle thousands of cases, and the number of denials that we've actually seen Medicare do has not changed. In fact, for years and years and years, I never saw Medicare deny something. Even a worker's comp or Medicare set aside has been around for many years. But in liability, it's very rare that Medicare has actually denied something. I've seen it happen less than 20 times, tens of thousands of cases, up until this point, up until this point. So what's been going on is that these, you have certain experts and Medicare vendors and firms that are really pushing this issue out of here and trying to sell this MSA on the business of fear, okay? And it should be the opposite of fear. A Medicare set-aside, the issue of the Medicare set-aside should be viewed the same way you view conditional payment, okay? So what's been going on over the last six months? So back in April, CMS started to hold key stakeholder meetings, invite-only stakeholder meetings. And there are multiple groups that they've met with. One of those groups is a group called by the name of National Alliance of Medicare Set-Aside Professionals. 
it's the only organization in the country that exists that's focused and dedicated to Medicare set-aside professionals. And NANSAP has also, over the years, worked very closely with CMS in formulating policy as well as liability MSA. The other groups that met with CMS by invite only were AAJ, uh, Insurance Industry, AIA, and not two other stakeholder groups, which I won't mention, but it's all public knowledge what I'm talking about, so none of this is, what I'm telling you is, is not available to you. But the message was the same in all those different meetings. And again, we were able to provide feedback directly to CMS through some of these stakeholders and directly to CMS. But CMS is saying now they have an 18-month window to get things cranked up, cranking as far as establishing formal guidelines for Medicare set-aside on liability cases. So what happened at Workers' Comp, Workers' Comp, there was a big misconception that an MSA is always required in a Workers' Comp when someone that's on Medicare. Not true. There's, there's certain review thresholds in Workers' Comp. There's two different classes. Well, class one is a, you have a, a Medicare-eligible client whose case is selling for $25,000 or more. The other class is you have a Medi Medicare-eligible person in the next 30 months your case is selling for $250 or more. Class one, 25K, current Medicare recipient. Class two, 250K settlement, reasonable expectation of 30 months. When it hit that, that threshold, Medicare would actually take the time to review and approve potentially the MSA if it was submitted to them. It did not recreate a situation where you had to do a Medicare set aside. Okay? So that being said, there's still consequences potentially for not doing a Medicare set aside. But Medicare stressed in those meetings that this is going to be a voluntary process as it always has been a workers' comp. And the way that they're going to start enforcing this mechanism is denying services. Okay, that faucet has been turned on for many years. In the old days when you settled a case, you had nothing to worry about. You knew without a doubt that if your client was on Medicare, if you, when you resolved that conditional payment, Medicare was going to continue to pay and start to kick in and pay no questions asked. Those things may be changing very soon. And since, look, we have the power to do that under the authority of the Medicare Secondary Payer Statute that we, don't, we just simply won't pay for action related care if we don't feel like we need to. And CMS feels like the liability MSA is exclusively the responsibility of the plaintiff. Now, what I'm telling you here today, none of this is set in stone, but what the information I'm giving you is verbatim from Medicare. And they stress that this is a plaintiff issue, repeat plaintiff issue, and that they're not going after insurance companies. Now, for years, insurance companies have been concerned about it because they've got the deep pockets, and rightfully so. They've got the money. They think we can get punished by Medicare if they want to make an example of us. But as it relates to Medicare and protecting Medicare's interests, everybody has skin in the game as it relates to conditional payments, okay? But as a plaintiff attorney, Seema said, has said on the record in the, their previous memos that it's up to the plaintiff attorney to decide whether or not future medicals are funded and whether or not the Medicare trust fund has to be protected. That still holds true today. Uh, about a year ago, I wrote an article that said that CMS is in all likelihood going to be publishing a liability MSA reference guide, and they've made that clear that that's part of their initiative. And the workers' comp, we have a, already have a workers' comp MSA reference guide, and that was part of the task force and the team that went back to Medicare and said, look, here's what the liability MSA reference guide should look like if you're going to do this, and this is what's fair and equitable to our clients. Uh, but that should be coming out when they actually establish formal guidelines for the liability MSA. Eligibility, eligibility requirements are going to be exactly the same. You know, currently Medicare eligible or a reasonable expectation in 30 months, they'll actually take the time to potentially review and approve an MSA if it's submitted to them. Now, looking at the threshold, you mentioned those very small threshold of workers' comp, whereas in liability, they're looking at cases between 250 and 750 where CMS approval is going to be available and actually encouraged, meaning they'll have a formal process in place for cases that fall underneath that, within that, that range. Now, the flip side of that is Medicare still says every case, Medicare's interest has to be addressed, regardless of the size. The same holds true today as it relates to workers' comp. So if you as a trial attorney, the takeaway there is you need to be cognizant and recognizing your plaintiff who are Medicare eligible on the front end. God bless our clients. Many of them don't know what benefits they're receiving. I'm sure a lot of you right now on the intake are, are getting copies of their health insurance cards as we speak, but there are a lot of ways you can be proactive in identifying Medicare eligible clients. And this is a little concerning when I read this initially that 
CMS is going to apply a formula, and also above the 750,000 level, there's going to be a, considered a full commutation. Okay, so the reason why CMS has not yet acted on, on this liability space is that they can't figure out the apportionment issue. They can't figure out that A plus B doesn't always equal C. In workers' comp, it's a completely different animal. A plus B does equal C. There's a full commutation. Medicals are paid out 100%, dollar for dollar, no questions asked, the no-fault system. Liability, as we all know, is a completely different animal, and they can't wrap their hands around it. So they're, they're, they're indicating that there is going to be some type of formula, and they've also mentioned that it may be similar to what's done on the conditional payment side, which that in itself is not enough. The full case value has to be taken into account. Other variables revolving around the case have to be taken into account. So I'm be, be curious to see what happens there eventually. But whether CMS is right or wrong, this is what they always come back to, the Medicare secondary payer law. It says anytime there's workers' comp, no fault or liability insurance, Medicare doesn't want to be known as the primary payer. I've used this slide before, but it, it, I love this slide. It says the face you make when your friends invite you to eat and tell you the guy's wallet, okay? That's CMS. You go to the, you know, they always have that friend or family. You go out to a nice dinner or lunch and the check comes and they're diving underneath the table or going to the bathroom in case they got their wallet. If someone else has their wallet, Medicare wants them to pay. That's exactly how it works in the Medicare secondary payer statute. And if you don't know who that person is, by the way, you are that person. But Medicare set aside by definition simply is exactly like what it sounds like. It's literally money that's set aside as part of the settlement proceeds. And once it's spent down and spent appropriately on future action related care ordinarily covered by Medicare, Medicare is then back on the hook to pay. But the simplest way to look at this is like a deductible. So you settle a case for Grandpa Jones. Grandpa Jones gets a hundred thousand dollar check. Of that hundred thousand dollars, there's a ten thousand dollar surgery that's recommended that Medicare may anticipate to be spent down before Grandpa Jones starts to bill Medicare again. The fundamental issue that exists is Medicare does not want to get a bill for that surgery if they know, in fact, that Grandpa Jones was compensated for future medical and that surgery was part of that decision. That's the fundamental question that you as trial attorneys have to ask yourself. When you're settling this case, am I shifting the burden to Medicare to pay? So the purpose of doing a Medicare set-aside really is to protect everybody involved. From the plaintiff's side, plaintiff's attorney standpoint, your exposure is that not telling your client about this issue could potentially result in your client getting denied benefits down the road. And for those of you that don't know, there are a number of different ways that plaintiffs can be eligible for Medicare. Age 65, you have, if you have a client that's under age 65, which we frequently do, they can become eligible for Medicare through Social Security Disability Benefits after a period of 24 months. End-stage renal disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, all very sad conditions that we see a lot. And then there's actually scenarios where a child can be on Medicare. And believe it or not, we see quite a few of these where the child is disabled and they also have a deceased parent or disabled parent. They can be eligible for Medicare. There's usually these private cases where we have a child that's on Medicare. So going back to that list in this litmus test, number one, Medicare eligible. Number two, is future care recommended or going to be necessary and or are you claiming future medicals? Now, we all recognize that when a case starts, there may be multiple body parts that get lumped in and claimed as part of the accident. But ultimately, when the case settles, it's important as a trial attorney to drill down on exactly what's being claimed at the time the case resolves. And in being in agreement with the other side, so what you don't want to happen is you settle a case and maybe it just involves a back injury. But what gets reported is the neck, back, and ankle. The next thing you know, you get your client 3% down the road that's not related to this, and Medicare flags it and denies it. We don't want that to happen. So you have to be communicating with the other side. Are there money left over to fund future medical? This is a tough one because Medicare has set on record also through the memos that you can't just bifurcate damages and say everything is uh, you know, non-propensity non-punitive or punitive damages or economic damages or it has to be very clear spelled out that there are monies there available for future medical okay so you can't just by default say there's no money there to fund future medical but there are many situations when there really isn't there, there's case law to support not doing a medicare set aside 
when there is no money to fund these medicals. The case by the name of Starrett versus Clebart, where a gentleman was at a party for his neighbor's house, and he fell down the stairs and became a paraplegic. He settled for $650,000, and he decides one of the adequately consider Medicare's interest. He ended up going before a judge. The judge looked at all the facts of the case. There's a large consortium claim. There was a lien and said, you know what? There's just simply no money here to fund future medicals. I actually arrived into Minnesota this morning uh, to speak at a conference later today. It was, it was 90 degrees yesterday. This morning when I left Florida, it was 9 degrees today when I landed. Um, but I, I bring up Minnesota because we had a very sad case recently where uh, there was a husband and wife that were out to dinner, and they were hit by a drunk driver and struck by a drunk driver. There's very limited coverage. It was a $500,000 policy. They both became paraplegics. And the attorney called us and said, Josh, the defense is trying to make us do an MSA. And we said, let's just look at all the facts here. There's simply no money to fund future medicals here. Those cases exist not only on $500,000 policy limit cases, but they can be same can be said for bread and butter cases. And when I talk about the litmus test, there's no real threshold uh, as far as you need, needing to evaluate when do we need to consider Medicare's interest. It's really every case. We have some clients that call us on $15,000 settlements every case. They want a letter for their file saying there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. And in those situations, we're happy to do that. But for a $500 fee, we can put together a letter for your file that says we consider Medicare's interest, looked at all the facts of the case, and for these reasons, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. But there are also situations in the complete opposite spectrum where maybe there's a million dollar settlement or $2 million settlement where we can still make the argument that there's no money there to fund future medicals. And then you have different options as far as what's going to be done is protecting Medicare's interests. Well, if an attorney's risk, it bears worth repeating, but you as trial attorneys have to communicate early and often with your, your clients about the issue. And at the very least, document your file that you had a discussion that, look, there is a possibility that Medicare could deny something. It's super, super low as it stands today. I got a better chance of playing for the Yankees right now than I do for Medicare denying something, but that could change. Medicare is telling us that's going to change. In fact, the next 18 months, they're going to be rolling out these formal guidelines, supposedly. And what happened in workers' comp, I don't want to, want to happen in liability. In workers' comp it just has become the de facto mechanism of settling comp cases involving Medicare beneficiaries, where a Medicare set aside is done in every single case. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but this is a real-life example of a case uh, that occurred early on at the beginning of this year. Case settled for husband and wife, and we got this panicked email from the client saying that Medicare has declined to pay for future medical claim and for a procedure that was related to their auto accident. And they're petrified now that going forward, that Medicare is going to pay for anything. And they were, they were actually offered to do a Medicare set at the time of the settlement, and they refused to do it. Um, but this is just one example where Medicare actually came back and denied something. And this is not a coordination of benefits issue. This is an issue where the liens were resolved and Medicare uh, refused to pay for that treatment. And the case is still ongoing as far as paying on those benefits. Real world example. So it really comes down to what the defendant's position is versus the plaintiff's issue. And I wrote an article several years ago about the disconnect between the plaintiff's side and the insurance company side. So the plaintiff's are used to not having to deal with this issue. The insurance companies are used to dealing with the Medicare set aside issue as it relates to workers' comp cases. They've been doing it for years and years and years. The problem with that, as I've already mentioned, is that comp is a completely different animal than liability. There are other factors that come into play. And what we're seeing and getting calls on every single day is that you're settling a case, whether it be for $50,000, $20,000, $20 million, $50 million, whatever the amount is, it doesn't matter. When you're going to settle that case, you're getting a release. It's getting you're getting jammed with release language that is trying to maybe potentially handcuff your client and/or force your client to do a Medicare set aside. And what we've been educating the other side on is that look, a Medicare set aside isn't the end all be all. Nor is just getting a letter from the doctor saying there's no future care the answer every time. There's gray area, there's middle there's middle ground for that. So many of you may be dealing with some of these large insurance companies uh, like Nationwide. Progressive. Some of them have standard Medicare set aside agendas that they use in every case, and, and it's very difficult to get them to move off those that language. And I've had multiple cases this year where we had to threaten action and threaten to enforce, get a motion to enforce the settlement, and hit them for penalties and fees if they didn't agree 
to cut the checks and, and finalize the release. So that's why if you have a Medicare eligible client, instead of waiting for the issue to kind of bear its head, it's important to get out in front of it. Because what I don't want you to do is you're in a situation where you find yourself waiting for a settlement check and a month goes by, two months goes by, and all of a sudden now you get a very upset client who doesn't know how much money they're getting in their pocket, nor do they, do they know when they're going to get paid. You have to be go on the offensive with this. And there's got to be greater education uh, amongst the insurance companies. And uh, we're starting to get a lot of phone calls uh, from insurance companies in defense of, of law firms uh, to, to do CLEs for them, which I'm very encouraged by. We're not working with them, but we're, so we want to educate them. And that so when you settle a case, there's going to be no bumps down the road. Now, oftentimes, there's a disagreement between whether or not the MSA should be done at all, right? But there are situations, too, when both sides agree, look, we should do a Medicare set aside. And we think it's the best thing for the plaintiff here. It makes a lot of sense. It checks all the boxes off. And then it comes down to the amount that's going to be set aside. Uh, there was a case in Virginia a couple weeks ago that we were working on where and a matter of fact, another case out of Virginia today, totally different law firm, where the defendant wanted a copy of the Medicare set aside. It wasn't good enough just to give them the number, nor was it good enough just to put protective language in the lease. They wanted an actual copy of the, the report, and they didn't agree with our number. And that is starting to happen much more frequently than I'd like, where, ironically, when the case is being negotiated, the defendant is saying the case is worth a lot less, but when the time comes Time to set aside money, they're arguing the exact opposite, saying it's to set aside more money, more money to be put up, um, which can get really ugly really fast. And what we've seen historically is that if you hold their feet to the fire on saying, look, this is a plaintiff issue, this is language that we want in the release, this is a number that we're comfortable with based on all the facts of the case, they eventually will cave um, on that issue without having to go to court. We have had to go to court many times and when that happens medicare gets put on notice and most of the time they never show up in fact they've never shown up to a, hear a hearing that we've been a part of and very rarely have they ever done it and, and case law is out there best practices go on the offensive um i've already mentioned this but you, you got to start at the intake process you got to identify potential medicare beneficiaries nowadays medicare advantage plans are huge and medicare advantage plans are different than traditional medicare so there's a ton of case law out there on Medicare Advantage plans as it relates to conditional payments that saying they have the same rights of recovery under the Medicare Secondary Payer Statute. What I can tell you as it relates to Medicare's future interests is that I've never had a client be denied something who had a, who had a Medicare Advantage plan. I'm going to repeat that. I've never had a client that's had a Medicare Advantage plan have their benefits denied, assuming the conditional payment was, was resolved at the time of the settlement. I'll give you an example of a case that was involved in where probably four or five years ago, it was a quadriplegic uh, on a workers' comp case in Florida where the, the Medicare set-aside was close to a million dollars. And the case resolved on the basis that there would be a million-dollar Medicare set-aside established as part of the terms of the settlement. The plaintiff agreed to that and initially set up the account. Of course, we advised in that correct administration is, is totally recommended. It's too complex for anyone to handle more or less a million-dollar Medicare set-aside. So what he did was he purchased a Medicare Advantage plan. So for those of you who don't know, a Medicare Advantage plan, there's different types of Medicare Advantage plans. There's supplemental plans, and there's certain plans that will replace all of the same traditional benefits of, of Medicare, Part A and Part B, Part D, that can be had for the same amount of premium that they're paying right now out of pocket for their normal Medicare. And those plans are administered and handled through private entities like Blue Cross Blue Shield, like a Cigna, like Humana. So those bills, instead of getting shipped directly to Medicare, when that bill is processed, it's going through the private entity. Now, Medicare has gone on record to state, look, we are sharing what's called the common working file now with our Medicare Advantage providers. What the heck does that mean in plain, plain language? A common working file is set up on anybody that's eligible for Medicare. A file is established on them to track their entitlement benefits, to track their Medicare information. So under Section 111 reporting requirement, when that's being done, the defendant is reporting that claim to Medicare, that information is getting lumped into the common working file. Okay. And last year, when I spoke at the NAMSAP annual conference, 
on liability Medicare set aside sale organization. The keynote speaker was a gentleman by the name of John Albert. John Albert said at the time, 97% of what Medicare tracks and, and looks at comes directly from the reporting requirement. That is a huge number, meaning even though Medicare may be dealing with you directly on the conditional payment side, they're looking at the conditional, they're looking at the common working file that's being done and, and handled by the Section 111 reporting requirements being filled by that. So, again, it's incumbent on you as trial attorneys to make sure that the appropriate information gets filed. But going back to a Medicare Advantage plan, Medicare is supposedly sharing this information with their providers. They have the same ammunition that traditional Medicare and CMS does to turn off that faucet and deny something if they wanted to. I haven't seen it happen yet. I think there's a lot of case law that exists with Humana. I don't want to... I hope this never happens, but I think we're going to test, we're going to see at some point in the next 12 months where we're going to have a situation where there's going to be a Medicare Advantage provider or a traditional Medicare where they're trying to challenge the, this issue of denying benefits, but that hasn't happened yet. <clears throat> but as of today, pretty and clear if you plan as a Medicare Advantage plan. There's a, a single form that we can provide to you that enables you to, to confirm what benefits your client is actually receiving. It's a one-page document that they can go to their local Social Security office or you can, on, on behalf of them as their trial attorney, complete for them and in five minutes find out exactly what benefits they're on. What is the SSI, SSDI, Medicare, Medicaid. So you can, from a timing standpoint, you, you can know out of the gate that, look, this is a case I need to circle circle back on because this client has applied for disability benefits. This means there's a reasonable expectation that they may be able to Medicare soon. Um, and you can circle it. And you've got to establish internal protocols for your law firm, not just identifying healthcare insurance and, 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 and talking to your clients, but it's talking to your clients about all the issues that you do already on a daily basis. When you intake a case and onboarding a new file, a new client, you're having these discussions about conditional payment. Instead of running away from the Medicare set aside issue and looking at it as a negative, Put it on the agenda to have a discussion with your client that, look, you're on Medicare or you're going to be eligible for Medicare very soon. This issue may pop up. I just want to give you the heads up that we may have to address it. And we're going to have to take into account Medicare's interest regardless. So this is something that needs to be on our radar so they can start thinking about it. The earlier, the better. We get involved in cases from the get-go. A lot of times we have clients now that as actually as part of their demand package, uh, when applicable, they'll retain us early on and build in the Medicare set-aside analysis as part of their uh, demand. That way, those damages are being established in the front end, and there's a discussion about the issue immediately, okay? And before there can be any discussion about other damages, the Medicare set-aside issue has to be addressed. And we've seen firsthand where it's made a big difference as far as the value of the case uh, when negotiating it, when, you, when it's done that way. You know, happy clients. Um, I talked about this already, but I'm going to talk about it again. This is not a fear tactic. This is not. It's the opposite of fear. When we meet with a client, we tell them point blank: the odds are Medicare is going to pay for you going forward. But if you're worried about this issue, you could get this analysis done. You can have something in your file that says, "Look, we've we've addressed Medicare's interest, and oh by the way, you can set aside this money in a separate interest-bearing account, and if Medicare continues to pay." You've done nothing wrong because it's a voluntary process to set aside this money. But you still clearly have to recommend you set, set aside this money, keep it separate. So if Medicare ever did come back and say, oh, we shouldn't have paid this bill or we're not going to pay something, that Medicare set aside account is still intact. Now, after 10 years or some inordinate amount of time has passed and Medicare has continued to pay, the odds are that they're going to continue to pay. But if Medicare flags something and says, oh, we shouldn't have paid this bill, Guess what? More often than not, the client's going to get the benefit of actually paying back Medicare at the Medicare allowable rate, which right now is not the way it works. When a Medicare set-aside account is set up, the plaintiff or the injury victim is at the mercy of the billing system of the providers and, and telling them, look, I'm a cash payer. And it was, it was what we call usual and customized fee schedule, and they're at the mercy of trying to negotiate the best cash price, which means they're spending that money a lot faster if they're using that money the right way and setting it proactively. From a Medicare standpoint, clearly if a Medicare set-aside is going to be set up, 
they want that individual to spend that money proactively. So it becomes a double-edged sword. If they're using it proactively, they're spending at the higher fee uh, schedule, but they're also exhausting that fund, that money quicker, which means they're going to have access to Medicare's tab. The flip side of that is the Medicare rate. Medicare rates are so much cheaper than tax prices. One of the things I didn't mention about those meetings with Medicare is that they have said, look, going forward, we are considering pricing these things out at the Medicare fee schedule, which is the best news that one of the best things I heard out of that, all those meetings is that for too long, it didn't happen in workers' comp for years, it happened everywhere as it relates to Medicare set aside. These Medicare set aside are so overfunded because the pricing mechanisms that CMS currently requires are so out of whack with reality. That may change going forward. And this is a cost that's bared by the client, ultimately. You may front the cost just like you would for a life care planner or a voc rehab person. The same goes for a Medicare set-aside specialist. We have nurses in-house that prepare these reports. For 2000 bucks, we'll prepare a full Medicare set-aside analysis. We'll advise on relief language. We'll advise on demand strategies. We'll advise the client directly. All that is included in that fee. But we have other alternatives to doing just the Medicare set-aside. Um, I frequently get asked for release language and try to decode and for CYA language, safeguard language. As a takeaway from this presentation, we will provide anybody that wants it a one-page document that you can stick in your file that says you had a discussion with a client about the Medicare set aside implications and that they agreed not to do anything. Um, now, if you want to dress it up a match, we offer a formal consultation and waiver service that's more detail where we actually have a an hour-long discussion in person or by go-to meeting or by teleconference where we lay out the issues for the client and let them make an informed decision. Going back to the, the very first slide, we can't make our clients do a Medicare set-aside, but if you have a client that's worried about the issue, we can talk to them. And that takes the pressure off you as a trial attorney as well, saying, look, I've recognized that you're on Medicare. Out of my concern for your well-being, I want you to talk to these folks so they can get you educated on these potential issues. And it becomes the opposite of here. It becomes from the standpoint of, look, we are concerned. We want to protect you. And that's genuinely what we, we, we get involved in these cases because we want to protect our, our clients, the injury victim. But that, with that consultation waiver service, if they elect not to do anything, we'll then prepare a very comprehensive waiver for them to sign. But if they ultimately like to take the next step uh, in doing a full analysis, uh, we can do that and apply the cost of that service as a credit. So some parting shots, you, you got to consider Medicare's interest in every single case. If there's, if there's no reason to consider doing a Medicare set-aside or, or setting aside money for anything or just taking action to protect the Medicare trust fund, you have to document that why. Because you got to have something in your file that states, look, I address the issue. Uh, I sat on a panel in Wisconsin a few weeks ago with a very seasoned adjuster who said, Josh, in every single case, we're requesting that reporting information, and we're putting Medicare release language in our files regardless. I would encourage all of you to, to push back on that language. Most of the time, if you have a client that's not going to be eligible for Medicare, the language is going to be not applicable to the situation. That being said, it's kind of a no harm, no foul, but you still don't want to ever have your client sign off on something that doesn't jive with what the reality is. And the same goes for you as the, as the plaintiff's attorney, claimant's attorney. A lot of these adjusters and defense companies now are putting a signature line, and not only putting a signature line, but making you, the trial attorney, sign off and saying that you take responsibility for the Medicare suicide, not the plaintiff. You've got to be cognizant of that language. And we're happy to review language all day for you and no charge if you want to send us that language. Because obviously, we'd like to earn the business at some point, but at the same time, we want to be a, a resource for you, a trusted resource at that, and as it relates to these issues. And I want to give you guys some other takeaways as far as um, language and protective language that you can in, in, integrate into your files. So these insurance companies, they're using standard language and everything. So why can't you as trial attorneys and plaintiff attorneys use standard language as it relates to release language and Medicare secondary care compliance? It, it's out there. If you want some of that language that blankets everything and make sure you're protected, especially on files where the client is not on Medicare or does not have Medicare eligibility. There's some standard language that you can integrate into your practice on all your cases. 
and paper your file any which way you can. The more documentation, the better. Our nurses take calls all the time, especially as it relates to ICDK. We're happy to do that. I'm going to keep hammering on that because it's such an important issue. There's over 140,000 different ICDKs, and you cannot have the wrong information getting being reported by the defendant. So as a, as a safeguard, what you can do is it's literally a two-sentence paragraph where in the release language you can say, also, my parties agree that the following ICD codes are being claimed and are compensable as relates to this case. Boom. Short and sweet. If, if there's ever anything in doubt down the road, if the wrong information gets reported, you go back to the tapes. You go back to the release and say, look, this is exactly what was claimed as part of this case. Here's your litmus test again. Plaintiff el is the plaintiff eligible for Medicare benefits? Is future care recommended by a treating doctor? And as a case fund future medical. This little one thing is a great piece that we're going to send out to you guys that you can put on your desk. Um, so you can screen these cases and your staff can screen these cases. But I'm going to fly through these liability MSA myths. There's a big misconception that when we're doing an actual formal MSA analysis that we have to review every single page of medical records that is in existence. That's not the case. We can actually do a life do a Medicare set aside based on a life care plan. If it's a, if it's if the current life care plan, then obviously we recognize and appreciate a litigation life care plan versus a real world plan. But my point is that you don't need every single record that's out there on the client. You can do it. What we really need is the last 12 months worth of information and the current medication, less what's being taken by the client. That's all we need. Along with that, we cannot rely on the IME report. We get that call 50 times a week. Dude, Josh, I've got an IME from the other side saying that um, this is not compensable. It's not related. Unfortunately, from a Medicare standpoint, it holds no weight. It doesn't hold weight. Okay. Um, now, if the, the treating doc is in agreement with that IME, of course, we're going to take something out or agree to put something in and include it. But we can't just solely rely on the IME report when preparing an MSA. Another big misconception is that it takes an inordinate amount of time to prepare a report. That's not true at all. We can do a report in 24 hours. If you give us the, the, the accurate information that we need to do it, of course, we operate better when we have more time to prepare, but as, as it is the case with anything, but I want to stress that we can get a report done if, if need be in 24 hours or less, if, if it has to be done in, in preparation for a mediation or a deposition or a trial. I also testify and have testified multiple times as a Medicare secondary payer expert. My partners frequently do the same as well all frequently published in this, in this area. It's something to think about. Um, another myth is that CMS approval on, on Medicare set-aside is mandatory. Nothing could be further from the truth. Just like a Medicare set-aside is never required, CMS approval is never required. So if this thing hits in the next 18 months, and I say this thing, these formal guidelines actually come to market, I would encourage everybody not to do CMS approval, at least as it stands today. There's so many problems with the, the current system in place uh, with the current review contractors that's dealing with workers, workers' comp cases. Right now, in the liability space, 99% of the time, they're not even reviewing liability MSAs. And I'll give you examples. There's certain regional offices that are reviewing them. There's certain that unequivocally are not touching them. For example, California. If you try to do a submission in California liability MSA, you won't even get a response. There's case law out there that exists where the settlement parties made the contingency of the, the case settlement settling be CMS approval. And guess what? CMS never responded. And the case never ever resolved. So the takeaway there is it's voluntary. You don't necessarily have to do it. As long as you're setting aside a good faith estimate, if you're going to do a Medicare set aside and document your file, that's all you can do. Because what can happen is if you do try to submit it, number one, Medicare may never respond to it. But number two, if they're having a bad day, they can blow it up for whatever rhyme or reason and say, you know what, we don't agree with this number. It should be much higher. You don't want that to happen as well for settlement. Um, a liability MSA should be fully funded regardless of the recovery of the plaintiff. This is a huge problem, which I've talked about already, that we see all day, every day, where the defendant is insisting on fully funding a liability MSA. Here's the problem with that. When we are preparing a Medicare set aside, as it stands with the current methodology that CMS recommends, it assumes that 100% recovery is being made on that case, which arguably every single case in the liability context 
never resolves dollar for dollar full value. That gives us flexibility to reduce and apportion that um, based on all the facts of the case. And this number, 87%, is what we're averaging as far as taking that number down, the obligation down. So put that in a real world context, $100,000 Medicare set aside obligation becomes a $13,000 Medicare set aside obligation. And more often than not, we're looking at these cases and saying, look, for these reasons, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. Okay. Um, that ha that's happening with a very high frequency. But going back to the apportionment, ultimately, if you're going to retain a firm like ours or anybody else to, to be on your side, the goal becomes how do we get the lowest number possible while making sure all parties are protected. And that, that becomes the, the, the sole focus once the case resolves. Now, prior to the case resolving, it may be a different focus, but once the case resolves, the more money we can save that, that have to go towards protecting Medicare, the more money that's going to go into client's pocket, which, again, is going to give you a happier client ultimately down the road. CMS allows these things to be funded with a structured settlement. Instead of a client having to spend down the full $100,000 over their normal life expectancy, we can potentially buy and see a structured settlement that's going to pay out $100,000 over that person's life expectancy. And that's important for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, they could potentially have access to Medicare's tab a lot faster. If they have to spend down $100,000 over their lifetime, it's, in theory, it's going to take them their lifetime. So we prepare reports based on a life expectancy. So instead of having to wait 20 years to go back on Medicare's tab, we could fund it with an annuity. So the seed money is, is used to open up the account, and then annual payments that kick in by the structured settlement annuity that feed into that account every single year, starting a year from approximately one year from the time of settlement. What that means is if that money is exhausted at any given point, Medicare is back on the hook to pay again. So they can have Medi access to Medicare's tab a lot faster. And oh, by the way, the average savings doing this MSA funding with a structured settlement is about 60%, which is a huge dollar savings for our clients. Let's wrap this baby up. Um, consult with experts, advise your clients about the issues, and document your files. My partner, Jason, came up with this CAD. Consult experts, advise clients about the issues, and document. That's all you can do as plaintiff attorneys. You can't force them to do it, but I also don't want you to run from the issue. Address the issue early on with your clients. Have a candid discussion with them. Bring us in. Let us have those discussions with them. It takes it off your plate. It's a cost to the client. And ultimately, it's at that of the position of, look, we want to make sure that you, the injury victim, are protected. And as a follow-up, here's our contact information. I would encourage anyone that has questions, please send those questions. And uh, we look forward to talking to you and working with you and also look forward to uh, meeting your staff and doing those CLEs. Have a nice day, everybody. Thank you.